Hello, and welcome to the newest episode in Dialogue Topics. I'm Taylor Petrie, editor of Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought. This season, we're talking about the history of LDS scholarship on specific themes, exploring a topic in depth to consider how Dialogue has been a forum for these important issues since its founding. We'll also bring you up to date on these topics with our more recent issues to discuss some of the current trends. All of our topics pages are curated to bring you comprehensive collections of annotated scholarship and may be found at dialoguejournal.com slash topic pages, all one word, or navigate there from our homepage. You'll find amazing resources and research on tons of issues. This month is February and is Black History Month. And in this episode, we give our attention to race. As we begin this discussion, it's important to know that Dialogue was born in the context of the Civil Rights Movement. Founded in 1966, Dialogue became the only independent forum for discussion of issues facing members of the church. And race issues were at the heart of this period. The church was embroiled in the civil rights movement, as was the rest of the nation. George Romney, the Latter-day Saint governor of Michigan, favored civil rights. Ezra Taft Benson, former secretary of agriculture for eight years in the Eisenhower administration, was a staunch opponent. And he began working in a, on a presidential campaign with various segregationists during this period. It's fair to say that church members were divided on the issue though a strong conservative bent among several leaders of the church, along with the church's policies on racial boundaries, meant that there was significant opposition to civil rights among many church members. In 1964 and 1965, major civil rights legislation passed in the United States. These were big accomplishments, but there was still a lot of civil unrest on these issues. There were major protests and riots in several cities around the country. This was one of the major issues facing the United States in the 1960s, and the church struggled to both explain and defend its own racial exclusion and segregation policies to a skeptical world and church membership, while also addressing the broader questions of civil rights and race relations in the country. Until 1978, the LDS church prohibited any man with African ancestry from being ordained to the priesthood, and men and women from the highest rituals of the faith. Attributing the reasons for this policy to divine curses made it hard to justify and was increasingly uncomfortable to explain in a post-civil rights America. I'll also note that civil rights groups were protesting the church, and this really comes to a head when Stanford University refused to play BYU in sports because of the church's racial teachings, which spills over to other boycotts as well. In short, this was a combustible period on race relations and a difficult time for Latter-day Saints who found their social values and the church's teachings in conflict. One final note before we dive in. The term Negro was commonly used to describe people of African descent in the 1960s and 1970s and did not have a derogatory meaning or intention. That changed by the 1980s as the term fell into disfavor. I will only use the term in this episode in quotations, but I wanted to alert listeners that the term will come up. The first phase of scholarship in dialogue is primarily focused on the practice of racial exclusion that prohibited black members of the church from full fellowship and privileges. There was both a moral and social analysis, as well as a historical one. The first time this was addressed in dialogue was a sensation. The summer issue of 1967, just the sixth issue that Dialogue had published, featured a letter from the editor of Stuart Udall, who was Secretary of the Interior in the Kennedy and then Johnson administrations, then the highest ranking Latter-day Saint in government. He had worked with President Johnson during the passage of major civil rights legislation and cared a great deal about issues of racial justice. His forceful letter to the editor in dialogue went right to the point, quote, 
The restriction now imposed on Negro fellowship is a social and institutional practice having no real sanction in essential Mormon thought. It is clearly contradictory to our most cherished spiritual and moral ideals. My fear is that the very character of Mormonism is being distorted and crippled by adherence to a belief and practice that denies the oneness of mankind. He wrote this letter more than a decade before the 1978 revelation that would change the policy, and it was a lightning bolt. Udall and his family were from Arizona, and active Democrats who'd helped along local and national civil rights measures. These matters were really dear to his heart. This letter to the editor at Dialogue wasn't the first time he'd raised his concerns with the church's teachings. Dating back to 1961, he had written private letters to LDS leaders expressing his criticisms and concerns. He continued the conversation behind the scenes for several years, sometimes being encouraged that change was imminent. But he'd grown impatient after the passage of civil rights legislation and decided to make his concerns with church teachings public and chose dialogue as the venue. This was a huge controversy and made national news. Time and Newsweek had begun to cover the issue, and it shined a spotlight on the church's teachings as well as exposed dissatisfaction among the membership. It also put George Romney, a supporter of civil rights, in the uncomfortable position of having to take a public stand on the church's teachings just as he was preparing for a presidential run. The response to Udall's letter was fascinating. He received several letters, which were later published, and many which were published in dialogue as well. Why don't you transfer to another faith, they said. I feel that you are not even worthy of the government position you hold when you use your church for your own benefit. Another said, it seems to me that you have one foot in the church, one in your government job, and an extra foot in your mouth. Many church members held that these racial doctrines were not only true, but absolutely essential to Mormonism, and that the church's leadership was more or less infallible on the question. By then, the dominant popular view was that the church had always taught these doctrines, tracing back to Joseph Smith, and had no authority to change God's law. But Udall also showed courage to many members who wanted and hoped for change. Grant Ivins, a former BYU professor, wrote to him, Let me congratulate you. This is a courageous statement of sentiment shared by thousands of church members. For one of your stature to take the lead in this long overdue movement for change is most heartening. Boyd Mathias, a law professor at the University of Pacific, hoped, quote, that this doctrine is changed before too many people have to pay the price of self-deception in order to be Mormons in the 20th century. Church leaders did not respond publicly, but sent Udall letters privately chastising him. Spencer W. Kimball wrote to him, Stuart, I cannot believe it. You wouldn't presume to command your God nor to make a demand of the prophet of God. It was a rebuke and a warning not to use his prominence to pressure the church publicly. It's notable that it was Kimball who would later receive the revelation overturning the past teachings in 1978. Kimball's letter also raised a major question that has haunted progressives for years. What is the best way to affect change in the church? Is working behind the scenes more effective? Or is public pressure and public campaigning more effective? The pressure on race issues became a classic example of this, with many coming to believe that public pressure actually caused the church leaders to retrench, to dig in their heels, delaying change. They didn't ever want to be seen as bowing to public pressure because it would diminish their status as prophets who were led by God, not public opinion. So many came to believe that letters like Udall's were doing more harm than good. But the debate remains an open one up until today. In fall of 2006, the early founders of Dialogue were thinking back on the 1960s and 1970s, an anniversary issue, and co-founder Wes Johnson reminisced, the Udall letter broke what had amounted to a taboo on bringing up the subject in print. Whatever else the effects, Dialogue became the official place 
where the serious conversation could occur. It was now on the national radar and certainly on the churches. There were a number of letters to the editor after Udall's discussing church's policies and a few book notes, but the beginnings of the scholarship really date to Armand Moss's winter 1967 article, Mormonism and the Negro, Faith, Folklore, and Civil Rights. This would be an enduring question for Moss, one of the most important scholars of Mormonism in the 20th century. A sociologist, Moss spent more than 50 years writing about race, including his magnum opus in 2003, All Abraham's Children, Changing Mormon Conceptions of Race and Lineage, with Illinois University Press. It's also evident that he himself grew and changed over time on this issue. Here's how he begins this first article. It is probably a distressing turn of events for most Mormons to see the Negro issue replacing the polygamy issue as the one feature most likely to cross the popular mind whenever Mormonism is mentioned. Just when it was becoming almost respectable to be a Mormon, another skeleton is dragged out of our ecclesiastical closet for all the world to see. He notes that the issue itself was bad, but the supposed defenses of it were even worse. It was embarrassing for Mormons in the 1960s, and they were not happy about it. The issue of respectability is a key one, I think. Mormons were hoping to assimilate, which they had done successfully up until that point. I'll point out that they'd achieved respectability in the first half of the 20th century by defending white supremacy. But the shifting grounds on race now resulted in a stumbling block for Latter-day Saints. This is a pattern that will repeat again and again on women's rights and later homosexuality. But Moss, in these early days, is a cautious defender of the church, even while being critical in some respects. Quote, My plea, then, is to the civil rights organizations and to all the critics of the Mormon church, get off our backs. The Mormon leadership has publicly condemned racism, and there is no evidence of a carryover of the Mormon doctrine on the Negro into secular civil life. In fact, there is evidence to the contrary. No matter how much racism you think you see in Utah, you can't be sure it has anything to do with Mormonism. But he speculates that there will be some changes, such as perhaps making the Aaronic priesthood available to black men. But he emphasizes, quote, Whenever change comes, it must come in the Mormon way. That is, the integrity of the principle of continuous revelation must be maintained. Here, he weighs in on the issue of public pressure, quote, agitation over the Negro issue by non-Mormon groups or even by Mormon liberals is likely to simply increase the resistance to change. So between Udall and Moss, we see Mormon liberals split on how best to bring about change, even if they shared the general embarrassment about the church's teachings and warned that it would harm the church in the long run if changes were not made soon. But this framing reveals a significant issue in this period. A lot of those who talked about this question suggested how unfortunate the church's policy was for the church. The white members suffered because of it. This scholarship was produced by white men who, while committed to racial justice, often prioritized their own suffering and angst about the issue as the real tragedy. While we're in this era, I just want to mention the article by our most famous contributor in winter 1968, Dallin H. Oaks, Law and Order, A Two-Way Street, an 11-page discussion of the race riots in Chicago where Oakes was living while teaching at the University of Chicago Law School and was part of a roundtable on riots, minorities, and the struggle for justice and order. It's an opinion piece opposing violence as a mean to social change. Quote, our society is afflicted with a tumorous disrespect for law, he warned. I think that this is an important piece to put into conversation with his October 2020 speech on Black Lives Matter which shows a remarkable continuity in Oakes' approach to racial issues, police violence, and protest. This is Linda Hoffman-Kimball of the Dialogue Foundation Board. 
This is Aaron Brown. I am Chris Kimball. My name is Dalen Amasimaku, board member of the Dialogue Foundation. For nearly two centuries, the Mormon tradition has produced a proud corpus of thought and culture. For the last 50 years, Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, has been the primary repository for the best of that tradition. As individuals have attempted to find new ways to be both Mormon and modern, Dialogue has provided the arena in which these conversations could take place. Dialogue's board of directors has made the decision to make all of the journal's content free the moment it is published. While we are fortunate to be in a position to make this transition, we are asking for your help so we can continue to do so for the next 50 years. Traditional readers can still subscribe to our quarterly print journal, but we also have a new donation model that allows readers to pledge a particular amount per month to support Dialogue's mission. Go to dialoguejournal.com forward slash subscribe to pass along the gift of Dialogue's deep, thoughtful analysis to a new generation of readers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next major development in the scholarship begins with Lester Bush, who first weighs in on this racial restriction of the priesthood in winter 1969. There, he wrote an extensive review of Stephen Taggart's 1970 book, Mormonism's Negro Policy, Social and Historical Origins, which argued for a social historical origin, not divine revelation or scriptural interpretation, dating the church's teachings on race to the Missouri period, which was an effort to appease slaveholders. Now, you might be wondering how a winter 1969 issue could review a 1970 published book. It's because dialogue was often behind schedule. Anyway, the social historical hypothesis was gaining ground among the intellectual class in the church, and Lester Bush would become one of the most important spokespeople but this early review sketched out some of his own ideas. Bush's contribution to the scholarship culminates in his spring 1973 article, one of the most famous ever published in Dialogue, Mormonism's Negro Doctrine and Historical Overview. Bush's article lays out neatly not only the socio-historical case, but also pushes the origins of the doctrine away from Joseph Smith's time at all definitively ending the Missouri hypothesis. Instead, Bush locates its origins squarely in Brigham Young's purview. He tells the stories of several early black converts, especially Elijah Abel, who had been ordained by Joseph Smith to the Melchizedek priesthood. It was only after Abel's death in the early 1900s that a concerted forgetting began to establish an exclusion policy. The article brings the issue all the way up to David O. McKay period and ends with several questions about the past and future fate of the church's teachings, expressing the view that new revelation was needed to answer those questions. Now, before this article was published in 1972, Bush had produced a very long draft of his research on the topic and circulated it among a few friends. That draft made its way into the hands of Boyd K. Packer, a new and conservative apostle who often found historians and dialogue in his crosshairs. He started corresponding with Bush on the topic. Once Bush circulated a near final draft of the paper to senior leaders of the church, Packer reached out again, urging him not to publish it until after he could meet with one of the apostles, a difficult task since Bush was stationed in Vietnam. When Packer and Bush did meet, Packer expressed disappointment that the article was published in Dialogue because it would, quote, lead to its use against the church. In fact, the editor of Dialogue at the time was pressured not to publish it at all and warned of trouble. Nothing ever happened to Dialogue or its editor or Bush. In fact, the article was well received, but that was probably aided by the fact that Dialogue chose to publish three commissioned responses to Bush's article in the same issue lending a perception of balance and fairness to the topic from Gordon Thomason, Eugene England, and Hugh Nibley. Thomason, a historian and sometimes apologist, acknowledged the angst about the topic and offered some historical and scriptural apologetics in favor of the church's exclusion. He tried to take a middle path, offering prayers for both the brethren and, quote, the day when the Lord says yes to the desires of my heart 
for my brothers, both black and white. Eugene England was more sermonic. He compared the whole affair to Abraham's sacrifice, calling the racial teachings of the church, quote, the Mormon cross. It was suffering for all involved. He said, quote, the policy of denying blacks the priesthood is rationally untenable from all perspectives but one, ecclesiastical authority. That outweighs all others. He saw the whole affair as a test for loyalty from many of the more liberal members who were both unconvinced of the justice or correctness of the church's teachings, but committed to trusting the leadership and trusting revelation. Quote, I believe that historical conditions in our country essentially unique to the world, including resultant attitudes of church members, brought about a situation where it was in the best interest of all involved for the Lord to institute a lower law for us to live until we are ready to live the higher law. So even the progressive voices were attributing the policy to the Lord for the benefit of the church. Hugh Nibley's response was not his best. Of Bush's article, he wrote, quote, This indispensable study seems strangely irrelevant the more one reads it. He says that if revelation guides the church, then the church's current policy is the result of revelation, and the only thing to do is go out and pray to get a revelation confirming it. The brethren have already studied the matter and prayed about it, he insists, and our duty is to do the same. He completely rejects the socio-historical analysis and insists that prophets don't follow the same rules. He defends the policy as not unjust at all, suggesting that it doesn't imply black inferiority at all. Honestly, this is pretty cringy. Quote, Brigham Young said the Negro must serve, but what is so bad about serving in the light of the gospel? The son of man came not to be served, but to serve. If we really took the Lord's teaching seriously, we would be envious of the Negroes. This is not his best and probably his worst. The letters to the editor in the journal were more complimentary. Quote, Greatly pleased with the last issue, Lester Bush's article on the blacks and the priesthood was by far the most enlightening piece I've read to date. Others went after the responses. Dr. Nibley's response was perhaps the most disappointing probably because I've always generally admired both his scholarship and his logical thinking. It was disappointing to find him ignoring the question where his scholarship could do the most service, the validity of the claim that the Negro people are descended from Ham, and presenting a rationale for current church policy that can only be described as strange. There were opposing views. Hugh Nibley's response elevated the value of the issue considerably. Another. Thank heavens for Brother Nibley. He's answered the critics of the church once again in his masterful response to Lester Bush. Bush's article ended up being incredibly influential and contributing to a culture, even among church leaders, that, number one, Joseph Smith was not the originator of the teachings, and number two, socio-historical explanations for the origins of the practice were far stronger than scriptural ones or appeals to any revelation. These factors paved the way for Spencer W. Kimball's 1978 revelation, ending the racial exclusions on the priesthood and temple blessings. In June of that year, Kimball confirmed, quote, the long promised day has come when every faithful worthy man in the church may receive the holy priesthood with power to exercise its divine authority and enjoy with his loved ones every blessing that flows therefrom including the blessings of the temple. Accordingly, all worthy male members of the church may be ordained to the priesthood without regard for race or color. Kimball's revelation was broadly well-received, but was still a bit of a shock people wanted to know what conditions changed to allow such a revelation to come. After 1978, the next phase of scholarship continued to examine the history of the racial restrictions with more research building off of Lester Bush. The summer 1979 issue of Dialogue was devoted to race and the new revelation on the one-year anniversary 
Newell Bringhurst published an important article in that issue, Elijah Abel and the Changing Status of Blacks Within Mormonism. Bringhurst is one of the most important scholars on race and Mormonism, also having published on this topic again and again. This paper really dives into the history of Elijah Abel, one of the early black converts who was ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood and the rank of 70 in 1836. Bush and others had mentioned Abel and his story became crucial to retelling Mormonism's racial past by hearkening to a more egalitarian version of Mormonism founded by Joseph Smith himself. The article also chronicles Abel's status in the Utah period and racial segregation and racism became increasingly important in Mormonism and how Abel got caught up in that fight and navigated it. In that same 1979 issue, Dialogue has tons of commentary on the revelation from luminaries like Sterling McMurrin, Jerry Bradford, George Smith, and others. But the dialogue editors also included the collected testimonies of ex-slave Samuel D. Chambers. Lester Bush was an associate editor at Dialogue and was surely behind this, introducing the primary sources of Chambers' testimony from the Salt Lake Deacon's Quorum Minute Book. 1873 to 77, one century before the 1978 revelation. They are remarkable to read over for how a black man in the 1870s in Utah participated in the church community. A few years later, in 1981, Armand Moss returns to the topic with The Fading of the Pharaoh's Curse, The Decline and Fall of the Priesthood Ban Against Blacks in the Mormon Church. This article really focuses on telling the history of the public controversy in the 1950s to the 1970s. It lays out an early account of the role that David O. McKay played in the eventual change of church teachings by attributing to him the new distinction between policy and doctrine, the priesthood ban being a policy and not a doctrine, but a policy that could only be changed by revelation. It was an attempt at a middle road between those advocating for change and those resisting it that reaffirmed revelation as the ultimate guide. The article also talks about how racialization was changing in these decades as the church was expanding internationally in the Pacific, Latin America, and in South Africa. Moss also gives an overview of what he calls the stormy 60s as the church dealt with unrest about the practice in and out of the church. It was a decade of bad publicity. At the same time, the doctrinal basis for the policy was further eroding. In the 1970s, the church was making more overtures to the black community to build bridges, especially after the series of civil rights protests in the decade before, including those against BYU. They are also beginning to offer more support to black members of the church, especially in lending support to the Genesis Group, founded in 1971, that offered opportunities for black members to socialize and support one another. The church also faced less intensive public pressure in and out of the church, and the hypothesis developed that this respite gave the church some breathing room to make changes that didn't look like capitulation to pressure. Moss had put forward this theory about how pressure against the church causes retrenchment before the revelation, but he seemed vindicated in his argument here. At the same time, he chronicles a number of public episodes from 1972 to 1978, showing that the issue hadn't really gone away publicly. It led to conflicts and embarrassing episodes in the media with the Boy Scouts and several excommunications of members who did ordain black men while it was forbidden. But the guiding factor, according to Moss, was the proselytization in Brazil especially the decision to build a temple there. Brazil was so racially mixed that determining lineage was nearly impossible and ultimately unwise. There's more to the story, but Moss analyzes closely the proximate causes for the revelation and gives a detailed history of what was known up until that point. This is Taylor Petrie, editor of Dialogue. 
I want to tell you about the Dialogue Podcast Network. In addition to great audio content you'll find in our feed, this collection is made up of shows by Latter-day Saints who wish to bring their faith into dialogue with larger streams of religious thought, like Mormon News Report, which takes a deep dive into topics pertaining to LDS culture, or Beyond the Block, which centers the marginalized in Mormonism. Other podcasts in this network include Face in Hat, Words Fall In, and Gospel Tangents Podcast. For links to these and all the other amazing content Dialogue has to offer, visit dialoguejournal.com. And while you're there, consider donating. Your sustained generosity is what enables us to continue our mission of facilitating dialogue in a spirit of learning and understanding. Thank you. In fall 1984, Mark L. Grover continued the analysis of what changed to lead to the revelation in his article, Religious Accommodation in the Land of Racial Democracy, Mormon Priesthood and Black Brazilians. Grover offered further support for the Brazil hypothesis that church growth in Brazil was really unsustainable with the doctrine of racial boundaries. This article lays out a history of the church in Brazil and the complications of the church's racial teachings created there. This issue created a conflict between Brazilian and American racial ideologies and a lot of heartache and confusion in those years. When Kimball announced a temple to be constructed in Brazil in 1975, that set the stage for the eventual changes as the church was now invested in Brazil. Again, this was just one of the impetuses for change but it decentered the U.S. civil rights controversies as the primary drivers for the 1978 revelation. In spring of 1990, Grover followed up this article with another one, The Mormon Priesthood Revelation and the Sao Paulo Brazil Temple. Here, he connected the revelation on the priesthood to the Brazil temple in direct ways, showing again the international context that shaped LDS attitudes and paved the way for the revelation on race. In 1992, famed LDS historian James Allen offered further contextualization for the church's globalization that began in earnest under David O. McKay in his article on Becoming a Universal Church, Some Historical Perspectives. Contrasting where the church was in 1950 with where it was in 1990, Allen recounted all the changes that had happened and noted dramatic shifts in church teachings and the makeup of the church itself. In winter 1994, Andrew Clark continued this trend in The Fading Curse of Cain, Mormonism in South Africa. About five years before this essay was published, South African apartheid came to an end, and in 1994, Nelson Mandela was elected as president. This is more of an essay than an article discussing what it was like to attend the all-black congregation in Soweto and talking about some of the members there. Still, it offers some history of the church in South Africa and a discussion of the historical and ongoing racial tensions there. While the articles from this period weren't so naive to think that racism was gone from the church, they tended to be celebratory and triumphalist about progress from the 1960s and 70s. They saw the church as more racially inclusive, which allowed it to grow internationally, showing how the 1978 revelation benefited the church. In the same winter 1994 issue, Eugene England returned to the pages of dialogue with his essay, No Respecter of Persons, A Mormon Ethics of Diversity. England calls Mormons to repent for the past and present racism and to embrace diversity as a core value. He wrote, Quote, we cannot succeed fully in taking the healing and unifying gospel to a world that remains divided by race and sex, by any form of fear of the other. We can't, especially if we as Mormons remain divided, until for us, as well as for our God, all are alike, black and white, male and female. It's a pretty forthright look at ongoing racism that he encountered at BYU, the shortcomings of leadership on this issue, and a strong theological and scriptural argument for diversity and equality. I should also mention that historian Jesse Embry published an article in the Spring 1990 Dialogue, 
separate but equal, black brothers, genesis groups, or integrated wards that looked at the complicated questions of fellowship and integration among black members. She notes that the tensions and questions around integration and the benefits of separate units or groups for black members that honestly still exist to this day is worth checking out an early take. In 1992, she published a follow-up, Ethnic Groups in the LDS Church, that offered a history of segregated ethnic wards and branches for immigrant and foreign language communities. The most recent phase consists of more history about the distant and recent past, and they chronicle more of the unfinished work of rooting out racism. 1978 was not a solution, it turns out. In 1999, Keith Norman wrote, Mark of the Curse, Lingering Racism in Mormon Doctrine. He discusses how the old explanations for why there was a priesthood restriction to begin with, including biblical curses and teachings about unworthiness in the pre-existence, continued to be taught in the church in the absence of any official condemnation of them. We also get new histories of the 1950s and 1960s with the groundbreaking new research by Greg Prince, who got access to the David O. McKay papers. These informed his biography of McKay, but dialogue readers get a preview of some of the research in his 2002 article, David O. McKay and Blacks, Building the Foundation for the 1978 Revelation. There are tons of great stories behind the scenes of how McKay both blocked and facilitated change. The policy slash doctrine distinction discussed earlier was a major innovation in this period. We also get access to tons of new information about the politics between church leaders in this period, including details that many church leaders wanted to change the policy as early as the 1950s, but were thwarted by those who vigorously opposed it. In the meantime, there were two major developments worth noting. One is a 2006 talk by then president of the church, Gordon B. Hinckley, vigorously denouncing racism. Then, in 2013, the church published the Gospel Topics essay, Race and the Priesthood, that provided a forthright look at the racism of the past and a denunciation of those teachings for the first time. The scholarship in dialogue over the past two decades often touches on these two themes, with further frustration with ongoing racism even after the 2013 Gospel Topics essay that disavowed early LDS teachings. It's worth pointing out that much of the scholarship produced in Dialogue's pages was by white men, men who were committed to racial justice, but church members of color weren't really telling their stories in our pages. I'm glad that the previous editors sought to address that in a variety of ways in recent years, and I hope that we see more of this. Race also started to take on broader issues beyond black and white in more recent analysis. In fall 2017, we see a series of articles on race and decolonization. Ignacio Garcia from BYU History and later chair of the Mormon History Association wrote, Thoughts on Latino Mormons, their afterlife, and the need for a new historical paradigm for saints of color. Robert Goldberg from the University of Utah wrote, Can Mormons be white in America? And Gina Colvin, there's no such thing as gospel culture. And of course, Moroni Benali's decolonizing the blossoming, indigenous people's faith in a colonizing church. These are important new turns in the scholarship on race that deserve attention. As we approach the current trends and issues in scholarship, I want to call particular attention to the fall 2018 issue of Dialogue published in commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the 1978 revelation. The whole issue is full of great content, from essays to historical articles addressing racism. It includes an excellent article by Lester Bush, Looking Back, Looking Forward, Mormonism's Negro Doctrine 45 Years Later. He tells the story of his writing and reception of his classic 1973 article, as well as reflecting on the progress and lack thereof in the intervening period. He also gives tons of details about what Kimball was doing in the immediate years before the revelation, studying the history intensely and discussing it with church leaders and scholars. 
He puts forward the Brazil hypothesis, by the way, as the immediate cause. There's also a stunning article by scholar Darren T. Smith, Negotiating Black Self-Hate Within the LDS Church. Here's an excerpt. For many Black Latter-day Saints who stay and practice their faith, the emphasis of the doctrines of the Mormon gospel on family and community often trump the racist past and present. Still others have come to believe, like their white counterparts, that statements by church leaders on controversial issues are institutionally sanctioned pronouncements by God, when in fact they often reflect individual, political, and social bias. Thus pointing out these inconvenient truths in the church is akin to cultural warfare. Black Latter-day Saints spend a great deal of energy reaffirming their humanity against the conservativizing forces in the church. And despite it all, these black members remain optimistic and hopeful that the Lord will cause the scales to fall from the eyes of white folk and deliver them from the morass. To this end, blacks in the Mormon church exert much labor, muddling through the rigors of racial battle fatigue, straddling two distinctly different and unequal worlds. The struggle, he notes, has resulted in ongoing damage to black members. Among the most important articles from this issue is Joanna Brooks, The Possessive Investment in Rightness, White Supremacy, and the Mormon Movement. This becomes a foundation for Brooks's 2020 book with Oxford University Press, Mormonism and White Supremacy. Her argument here is that white supremacy wasn't accidental or incidental to Mormonism, but was a key aspect of how the church survived and thrived in its 200-year history. She lays out in painful detail some episodes of white supremacy in various periods and then links these closely together with doctrines of prophetic rightness or infallibility, making both prophets and white supremacy difficult to separate and critique. There are many more from the fall 2018 issue, but the last one that I want to highlight is a fascinating article by Matthew Harris, another major historian who has many publications on this topic. His article, Mormons and Lineage, The Complicated History of Blacks and Patriarchal Blessings, 1830 to 2018, is honestly revolutionary. He examines some understudied primary sources, namely LDS patriarchal blessings, to see how racialization doctrines developed and continue through the lineage pronouncements in these blessings. For white members, lineage from the House of Israel is frequently pronounced. Here he explains, quote, Mormon leaders created an inchoate, confusing, and unevenly applied policy. Some patriarchs pronounced the seed of Cain on black members during their blessings, others the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, while still others no lineage at all. Only in the late 20th century do we start to see some consistency. It's a remarkable paper on how local LDS patriarchs negotiated changing doctrines on racial lineage up until the present day. In 2019, Dialogue published online a collection of BYU students' experiences of racism on campus and personal accounts of how it affected them. This fall 2019 issue also has a sermon from James C. Jones titled Racism that makes race a central moral issue, as well as a substantive sermon by Margaret Olson Hemming and Fatima Sala wrestling with racism in the Book of Mormon. More than just dealing with the Bible or Pearl of Great Price, this was the first dialogue sermon to really discuss the problem of race in the Book of Mormon. The same fall 2019 issue also includes an article from BYU professor and historian Rebecca Deschweinitz. There is no equality, William E. Barrett, BYU, and healing the wounds of racism in the Latter-day Saint past and present. This article tells the story of Barrett, a religious education faculty member at BYU, hired first in 1948 and became a famous popular historian of LDS history, most famous for his best-selling book, The Restored Church. But Barrett was a segregationist in the 1950s and 1960s and frequently taught theological justifications for the church's teachings on race, tracing it back to Joseph Smith and others. He was one of the main voices in the official hierarchy perpetuating these teachings to BYU audiences and beyond. This article shows just how much racism had infused church institutions like BYU before 1978. 
but how Barrett continued to teach versions of these racist ideas long afterward, and how, quote, BYU religious education continues to hold some responsibility for the obstinacy of racist justifications for the temple priesthood ban. So that brings us more or less up to the present day. We have looked at how the scholarship on this issue has gone through several phases and considered some ongoing questions. The early phase discussed the injustice of the racial policies and debated the role of revelation, public and private pressure, and prejudice in shaping LDS teachings. Then the scholarship turned to more serious historical analysis of the policy, especially in the 19th century, debunking many of the popular assumptions about the origins of the policy. After 1978, historians offered further contextualization of the history of LDS racial teachings, as well as discussing the more recent historical pressures on the church in the 1950s to the 1970s. With this in mind, scholars then looked to the international context, especially in Brazil, how that might have prompted church leaders to seriously reconsider the teachings and seek new revelation. There was also a feeling of celebration as the church was marching toward equality. But more recent scholarship has moved past 1978 as a turning point and instead considered how and why racism persists among LDS members and institutions. This work, including lessons on how to confront these issues, remains central to contemporary conversations. Dialogue is proud to have broken the taboo on discussing this topic in print and being a hub for scholarship and other expressions from 1966 to the present. Thank you for taking this journey through Dialogue Journal with me and for all your support. If you want to subscribe or donate to Dialogue, you can do so at dialoguejournal.com slash subscribe. This episode was written by me with editing and music by Daniel Foster Smith. Our content manager is Emily Jensen. The Dialogue Journal podcast is produced by the Dialogue Foundation, a registered 501c3, with support from Mary Thebes. This show was part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, a collective of independent, interesting podcasts who promote thoughtful, respectful, and engaging inquiry and discussion of all aspects of the LDS tradition, thought, and arts and culture. Like Mormon News Report, where Jenny and Brant take a deep dive into news topics pertaining to the LDS church. Check out all the shows at dialoguejournal.com slash podcast network. That's dialoguejournal.com slash podcast network.